the uh, the NFL just doesn't want defensive players to be able to tackle. Uh, that's pretty much what it comes down to. We'll talk about the hip drop today. That ought to be fun and exciting. The NFL does not give it a damn. Tyrese Maxey has an extremely hot start to the game, and the 76ers just finished ice cold. Can't beat the Sacramento Kings. We'll get into that conversation. Philadelphia Phillies wrap up spring training. Still waiting for the weather to turn around for Thursday. Opening day at CBP against the Atlanta Braves. Doesn't look like that's happening. Thanks very much, Cecily Tynan. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, and um, Howie Roseman addressed the media yesterday. I, I've had an about face with Howie Roseman. If you go from the time that he was banished to the broom closet, as it was said many times for, for Howie Roseman, right? If you go from that time to now, there's two Super Bowl appearances. There's the Eagles only Super Bowl. There's the uh, championship. There's the reset after Carson Wentz to get to that second Super Bowl. There's drafting Carson Wentz. And that, that of course, was was awful. And there's drafting Jalen Hurts, and, and that worked out. And it wasn't good this past year. But, you know, I tend to have shifted uh, my opinion on Howie Roseman, and I have tend to shifted my anger and frustration when things go awry with Howie Roseman, more so, or really the Eagles front office, away from Howie into Jeffrey Lurie. My, my question that I want to open up and throw out today is to you, is what, like, where does your anger go when you look at the Eagles front office? And I know you could throw in like, oh, it depends. Is it the draft? Is it free agency? Is it ignoring linebackers? Because ignoring linebackers seems to be, not seems, has been an Eagles philosophy uh, philosophical issue dating back to Joe Banner. And I used to work with a gentleman by the name of Al Morgani. And I think Al Morgani summed it up the best with Joe Banner. And I think there's less of this with Howie, but there's still a lot of remnants in this with Joe Banner. The Eagles didn't have players with names. They just had numbers and it's not a number on the back of their Jersey. It's a number on the salary cap. It's a number that they're willing to spend up to for a certain position. Back in the day, linebacker, uh, you know, a million, you know, quarterback, 25 million, you know, whatever, it would, you know, stuff like that. And that's not, that's an extreme case. But when you look at it like that, you kind of under, you kind of understand easier what the Eagles are doing when it comes to spending money. And that linebacker position is never one that they're really going to throw a whole lot of money at. That's why when I first saw the report of $7.5 million, for Devin White, I said, okay, what's the real number? The real number turns out to be about 3.5. <clears throat> That's, I think, worth it to take a, a chance on a linebacker that's just coming off a down year. And as I've talked about before, when they made the signing originally, <clears throat> you're talking about a guy that has dealt with injury issues in his career recently, coming off a down year, looking for another contract, looking for a prove-it deal if that's all he can get. Enter the Philadelphia Eagles. That is the perfect description of the Eagles, of, of who the Eagles want to sign. And that's exactly what they did with Devin White. But I have shifted my anger and my overall um, uh, uh, pissed offness about what the Eagles do from a philosophical standpoint, really away from Howie Roseman and more towards Jeffrey Lurie. When we talk about the analytics, when we talk about Nick Sirianni staying on for another year, for those that thought he was going to get canned, such as myself, and thought he should have been canned, such as myself, instead the Eagles gave him this reprieve of, you're going to be backing off a little bit, and instead we're going to be shifting towards uh, offensive coordinator having control of the offense and defensive coordinator having control of the defense, and you just kind of, well, you just do whatever it is you do to to, to make players happy and make, play, make players love you as much as they have. Okay, whatever that is. I look more at Jeffrey Lurie than I do Howie Roseman. And I think as Jeffrey Lurie's tenure as the Eagles owner has gone on, as it's continued, he has started to have this, uh, this feeling of, I know what I'm doing. I don't need as much help as I used to. So it's kind of shifted in a way. So when I hear Howie Roseman speak yesterday, and I hear him speak after making signings like Saquon Barkley and bringing back Chauncey Gardner-Johnson and, and, and giving uh, Bryce Huff a contract, even though, I yes, I am on the record saying I have had plenty of questions about Bryce Huff and what he's going to be able to bring to the table with this huge promotion the Eagles are giving him. Uh, I'm on the record with that. But when I hear Howie Roseman speak now, I do not give the eye rolls. Now, yesterday, I cannot tell you that I heard Howie Roseman speak. I did read the stories that were out there from the beat reporters that were around, but for whatever weird reason, the NFL, uh, Eagles, I guess, yeah, just the Eagles, because there was footage of 
Robert Saleh, and we'll play that for you, him talking about Bryce Huff, courteous, courteous, uh, uh, courtesy of Elliot Shore Parks. Um, there's also footage of Shane Steichen. Elliot Shore Parks got that as well. I saw another, uh, who's it, Mike Coblin. There's a lot of footage out there, just nothing of uh, general managers. So maybe it was a general manager thing. Nick Sirianni is supposed to address the media today, so I'm sure we'll get some footage footage of him. But when I read quotes from Howie Roseman, and when I have heard Howie Roseman speak at the end of the year press conference or at the uh, NFL Combine, I have heard a man that I believe it. That wasn't always the case. When I hear Howie Roseman speak now, it does not induce eye rolls as it once did many years ago. I mostly say that for Jeffrey Lurie. And we'll probably have footage of him addressing the media today. Him and and Nick Sirianni are supposed to be out there talking to the media at the owners' meetings in Arizona. So I look forward to at least hearing what they have to say because I want more reason to believe in this Eagles' upcoming season. I feel like the roster is coming together pretty nicely. And my favorite thing of all the things, and we're going to get into what Howie had to say about Saquon Barkley. We're going to get into what he had to say about Hassan Reddick. That won't take long because he didn't say anything. Uh, and also... The Eagles' uh, standpoint on Devin White and what they're expecting, as well as from Bryce Huff. But my favorite thing that Howie said yesterday was, we're not done. And when he talked about we're not done, he wasn't just talking about, oh, the draft is coming up in a month. He was talking about free agents. And the one move that the Eagles could make today, tomorrow, in the very near future, would be bringing in Justin Simmons to help patrol this secondary along with Chauncey Gardner-Johnson. That would be the move that would make me go, all right, how is wow would be? Saquon Barkley to this this offense, that's a wow me move by Howie. Justin Simmons to this defense would be a wow me move by Howie Rose. Now, will there still be question marks? Absolutely. Who's going to be the starting corner opposite Darius Slay as we have talked about? How is this defensive line going to hold up without Fletcher Cox and young guys looking to take a big step forward? What type of impact is Bryce Huff going to have? What does Brandon Graham have left in the tank? What's Devin White got? This is, is the Kobe Dean going to say, a lot more question marks on the defensive side of the ball still, but knowing that I have those two safety valves to this defense and a Vic Fangio scheme would make me feel a hell of a lot better. Oh, and Chauncey Garner-Johnson, of course, has experience in a Vic Fangio-esque scheme, while Justin Simmons has plenty of experience in a Vic Fangio scheme with his years with Denver, and, of course, his former head coach in Vic Fangio. So, to me, that would make me feel a lot better about life defensively. Uh, but before we get into the hip drop rule, which is what we're going to talk about next, I do want to talk about things that Howie Rose would talk about. And our friends at Jacob Media took this quote from Zach Berman and put it in a nice little graphic. For the people on the podcast, this is a nice little graphic. Uh, Saquon Barkley. This is Howie Rose was on Saquon Barkley. For us, it's hard to find special players at any position. We think Saquon is a special player. We think he's a special person. And so we're trying, or so, excuse me, so when we're trying to find those guys, they're hard to find, especially on the open market. But enter Saquon Barkley. The special player he later referred to as a freak. When talking about Saquon Barkley's workout regimen, the fact that he gets 300 touches, and hopefully this year he'll get another 300 touches. Uh, and even if he's not getting those touches, the impact of Saquon Barkley just being a guy you have to account for on the field will certainly bode well for Devontae Smith, for A.J. Brown. In the read option scenario that we've pointed out many times, it'll bode well for Jalen Hurts. Everybody on the offense, Saquon Barkley. This is why I don't like when you look at the numbers. I know a lot of people always the numbers are great, the numbers are sexy, the number are great. that's what builds our fantasy football teams, right? Oh man, we love numbers. <clears throat> but when it comes to actually playing the game, numbers don't always tell the whole story. That's why I always say numbers never lie, but they sure as hell can deceive. So if Saquon Barkley's numbers aren't that of career year, for instance, his rookie year of 2,000 yards from scrimmage. And I'm not going to say it's all of a sudden, oh, that's a failure. That's a failure. He didn't get all the numbers that uh, you know, DeAndre Swift got. No, side note, I think he's going to get the numbers that DeAndre Swift got, at least. You might say that's a fair bar because it's another running back that has played in this league. It's not with this team and these players as well. But overall, I'm just looking for the overall number of the Eagles to go up when it comes to points per game. And with a running back like this, 
with the ability to control the clock with a running back like this with Saquon Barkley. Well, then I would also like to see that point differential have a huge bump up from what we saw last year. I would like to see games that you win by 10 or more points to have a huge bump up from the two that you had last year, maybe closer to the six that you had in your Super Bowl run. Maybe. Maybe that, yeah, that sounds good. Let's let's have that. That would be my overall measure for Saquon Barkley's true impact on this offense. And yes, of course, if everyone stays healthy. Or at least, you know, give me 15 games. Can I get 15 games out of you? Can I get 14 games out of you? If you take a game off against the Giants, who might suck, then I won't be as, you know, mad. I won't be as upset. I won't be as pissed off, I guess. But for me, listening to uh, or, or reading about what Howie Roseman was saying about Saquon Barkley, it's the exact kind of player that you want to see on this offense, a playmaking running back. Uh, Howie Roseman uh, was asked about the change in philosophy when signing a running back and giving $26 million over two years to a guy like Saquon Barkley. Is that a philosophical change? If you're Howie Roseman, I think you would answer this question the same exact way. It's not a philosophical change. We're signing a playmaker. When we had Pat Leonard on the show from the Daily News, who was the first to report that the Eagles were one of the teams that were actually interested in Saquon Barkley. And I, said, I don't believe it. I won't believe it until I see him in an Eagles jersey, right? Well, I'll take you know pen to paper as believing that he's a Philadelphia Eagle now and him you know talking to the media and his daughter stealing the show and all that. Okay, fine, he's a Philadelphia Eagle. But, but one of the things that he talked about was – the Eagles are in a position right now where they could add a huge playmaker to their offense. And really, huh, you want to talk about things breaking down at the end of last year? With this weapon being added to the weapons you already had, it's going to be hard for me to believe that in the final quarter of the season, the Eagles will evaporate. Their talent will just all go away at the end of the season. When it comes to the talent on the, on the field and it comes to the, the play callers off the field, it's going to be really hard for me to believe that the Eagles are going to have a collapse towards the end of the year if they get out to a great start like they did last year and the year before. They're putting in as many fail-safes as possible, and I'm all for it. I'd like to see the same thing on defense as well, and that would be the next step. One of the things that did go away last year, and I was joking about this when I was on with our friends Jody McDonald and John McMullen on Bird 365 yesterday, but one of the things that I, I really need to see is uh, Chauncey Gardner-Johnson bring that swagger back. And Howie Roseman flat out said it. One of the reasons they went out there and they brought in uh, Chauncey Gardner-Johnson was obviously his talent, what he brings to the field. I've seen the, the I've seen it pointed out many times by now with Chauncey Gardner-Johnson talking about how um, you have a guy like that who is coming back here who uh, can certainly motivate with his mouth. And you have a guy coming back here who can uh, get after the football. And you're talking about nine games, six interceptions versus six interceptions the entire defense had last year. Chauncey Garner Johnson, two years, six interceptions, co-leader in the NFL for the year. Four, three other guys, three other guys with six interceptions. This past season, six interceptions for the Philadelphia Eagles. So, yeah, Chauncey Garner Johnson getting after the football going to be pretty huge for the Eagles this year. Ball hawk, as they say. I'd love to see it. But also, the swagger that he brings, the confidence that he brings, the accountability that he brings to the table and holding other players around him accountable, holding himself accountable. Howie Roseman, I'll go back to it. The best thing he said, a great start. Or it's a good start, he said. It's a good start. Yeah, this is, this is a really good start, Howie. You modest man, you. Keep on adding. I, I can't agree more when it comes to adding a guy like Chauncey Garner-Johnson, how, again, trying to avoid a historic collapse like you had at the end of last year, this is the guy that's going to help push that in the other direction. Because I don't think this guy's going to stand for anybody around him giving a lackadaisical effort like we saw towards the end of last year. And I know everyone wants to look at Nick Sirianni like that. I know everyone wants to look at Nick Sirianni and say, all right, well, if these guys are really playing for Nick Sirianni, how do they put forth that kind of effort? The more I move on from it, the more I just want to believe that the team was flat out cooked. Cooked. That's what that's what I want to believe. Is is it what I actually believe just yet? I don't know. No. Fresh out of ideas would be another one. The number one reason I've told you before, I'm not going to get into it, but the number one reason I think that the Eagles continued to fall throughout the year was they fired their defensive coordinator or put in the guy that had been in the booth the whole year. That was the panic most panic of panicky moves i've ever seen the eagles make and that's saying something
But when it comes to everything else with this defense, again, Justin Simmons would be the guy that I would be going after if I was Howie Roseman. If this was really only a good start, this would make it a great offseason when it came to free agency. Also, by the way, a guy that hasn't been mentioned enough, and I know he's had his injury issues in the NFL, but Matt Hennessy got to this yesterday with Jody and John as well. Matt Hennessy to me is a, is, a, is a pickup that I love. It's not a, a sexy name, all right? Well, Hennessy's sexy. But anyway, uh, <laughs> when it comes to uh, Matt Hennessy, this, this signing there, the biggest question mark on the offense was what was going to happen with the interior of this offensive line without Jason Kelsey, Tyler Steen at right guard, Cam Jurgens at center. Uh, Reuben Frank has been pumping out the opinion that Landon Dickerson can move to center if you really need it. If everything, oh, no, Cam Jurgens isn't ready to be reading these coverages and shifting protection and all that stuff. Cam Jurgens isn't ready for that. Do you move Tyler, Do you move uh, Matt Hennessy to your starting uh, center? Or do you move Landon Dickerson to your starting center? Do you move uh, Matt Hennessy to his uh, natural position of left guard? And then do you have Tyler Steen or, or keep Cam Jurgens at right guard? Like, there are question marks there. Are they as glaring as ones you might have on defense? No. But Matt, Matt Hennessy affords you that optionality he affords you flexibility as a guy that could play guard center or guard those right there are huge positions that the eagles need to have depth in and that's what they have do i believe they're going to draft an offensive lineman in the first or second round they're absolutely drafting an offensive lineman in the first or second round that's absolutely happening the question is whether or not to take the offensive tackle in the first round or to take um a corner in the second round I am rooting for linebacker like the lot of you. But this is the Philadelphia Eagles we're talking about. My feeling is offensive lineman. My prediction is offensive lineman in the first round of the draft. My prediction is uh, corner in the second round of the draft. That's that's my prediction. That's not what I'm rooting for. I'm rooting for a linebacker. But what I'm really hoping for is they go after that linebacker. But what I'm predicting is that they go after a corner in the second round. It just seems to be how the Eagles prioritize things. Um, a la Andre Dillard going in the first round some years ago. Uh, Sidney Brown going in the second round. Sidney Jones, excuse me. Sidney Jones going in the second round. Uh, the year the Eagles saw still the draft. It didn't work out then. Maybe it'll work out this time. Uh, so there's, there's situations like that. Staying on the defense side of the ball. Uh, moving on from Chauncey Garner Johnson to getting into the conversation of Bryce Huff yesterday. First off, Howie Roseman did not say the greatest thing yesterday about Bryce Huff. Talked about the acquisition, talked about the motor, uh, talked about you know, that they expect him to be that impact player uh, um, with this promotion for the Eagles, more so than he was with the Jets. But the nicest thing, the best thing that came yesterday was from Robert Saylor. Now, credit to Elliot Shore Parks, who got this video of Robert Saylor addressing the media yesterday, uh, when it came to Bryce Huff. I think you can hear this. If you're not, I'll summarize it. But uh, take, a listen, take a listen to this comparison. Uh, of who Robert Sala, excuse me, is comparing Bryce Huff to in the world of baseball. An elite, elite pass rusher, um, closes games. You know, he's, uh, you, know, like, you know, people want to say that all he does is rush the passer, but Omar Allen Rivera did his close ninth inning, so he's, uh, he's a pretty darn good pass rusher, and he's going to be great for Philadelphia. Okay, if you didn't hear it, I, bo I boosted the audio as much as I could. People say all Bryce Huff did was rush the passer. All Bryce Huff does is rush the passer. Well, all Mariano Rivera did was close games. Okay. Uh, many years ago, uh, there was a running back for the Philadelphia Eagles. His name was LaShawn McCoy. And Chris Collinsworth... Okay, yeah, I'm going Chris Collins with here. Would refer to him as, I know I'm going to get a lot of heat for this, but he's a lot like Barry Sanders. And you know what? I can see it. Now, it, it's, is he Barry Sanders? No. But I, this is why I try to stay away from comparisons as much as possible because people never hear the word like. They only hear for somehow. Somehow when you make a comparison, people don't hear like. They hear is. They didn't hear LaShawn McCoy is like Barry Sanders. They hear uh, LaShawn McCoy is Barry Sanders, and they're like, we got Barry Sanders. It's like, good. No, no, I'm saying he's like in this regard. So I don't mind them when I make them in my head. I just don't usually say them out loud. And then he started referring to LaShawn McCoy as a closer, as a Mariano Rivera. And a lot of NFL teams, the Eagles have certainly gotten away from this as well, but a lot of NFL teams have gotten away from this where they just 
just continue to milk the clock with one one running back. And that guy becomes the closer. Well, Robert Sala is looking at Bryce Huff as if he is that closer. Mariota Rivera is uh if I had one inning to close out, Mariano Rivera, the guy I'm giving the ball to. Bryce Huff, I, I, I hope you're right, Robert Sala. I hope you're right. But that's high praise, man. Look, what head coach knows him better? There is no head coach in the NFL that knows him better. I'm going to cross my fingers and hope you're right because – I'm the guy talking about whether or not Bryce Huff is going to be ready for this promotion that the Eagles are giving him. I'm the guy talking about whether or not he's going to be able to play on every down. And if the Eagles are paying him $51.5 million, $51.1 million over three years, then I kind of want him to be better than just a guy who's rushing the passer. And if he is going to be a guy who's just rushing the passer, then go ahead and you know give me 16, 17, 18 sacks this season. Give me a sack a game. Let me know that you're going to be a guy coming up there and, and in clutch moments. Be that guy. On third down, be the guy that makes sure the offense gets off the field. Excuse me. The opposing offense gets off the field. The defense gets off the field. Your defense gets off the field. That's what Robert Sala is selling. Oof, say that 10 times fast. Um, so we got Mariano Rivera here in Philadelphia now. Very excited about that. As far as Hassan Reddick goes, wouldn't really co- he wouldn't comment on a player's contract. So that's where we're at right now as far as Hassan Reddick goes. As you guys should know, well know by now, I have my fingers crossed that Hassan Reddick is going to be here uh, for at least another year. Would love to see it happen. Uh, it seems like the Eagles want his contract restructured. You guys know the, the, point, uh, the point we're at right now. Um, and Jeremy Fowler putting out the story that we talked about yesterday about how uh, teams expect Hassan Reddick to be traded at some point before the season. See if it happens on draft day. See if it happens leading up to the season. See if somebody needs a an edge rusher right before the season starts because of injury. Who knows when it's going to happen, but it seems like it's going to happen. I am still hoping upon hope that it does not happen. One guy I can have a lot of confidence in playing uh, a significant amount of snaps getting after the quarterback, being a proven commodity, knowing you're going to get double-digit sacks versus a guy who's only had one double-digit sack season in the NFL and Bryce Huff, who you just gave the mega huge Kajunga contract to. I'd very much like to know that one of those guys going after the quarterback and the very rare occasional go after the quarterback in a big Fangio defense is going to be a sound Reddick, a guy I can have full confidence in uh, when it comes to going after the quarterback and having success. So I've talked about the promotion with Bryce Huff. Hassan Reddick is the perfect example of a guy I want him to be promoted to. Hassan Reddick, for a guy that has great sack numbers, you know, double-digit sacks, right, uh, over the last four years, the, the, for, for being that guy, he doesn't play just on passing downs. Hassan Reddick doesn't just play 40% of the snaps. Hassan Reddick over the last three seasons, has played at least 74% of defensive snaps. Uh, over the last four, uh, four seasons, 79% in his last year with the Cardinals, 83% in his one year with the Carolina Panthers, and then over the last two seasons of the Philadelphia Eagles, has played at least 74% of the snaps. 74% of the snaps in each of the last two years. Is Bryce Huff ready for those kind of numbers? That's my question. The money he's getting, better be ready, bud. Because that's what the Eagles are depending on. A uh, lot of questions. A lot of questions about what Bryce Huff is going to be able to bring to the table. If it is, hey, if, if you're just putting him out there for half the snaps even, 50% of the snaps, better win those battles. Better win those battles, Bryce. Better be a good year in South Philly for guys named Bryce. That's all I got to say. Uh, all right, that's uh, where Howie Roseman was at yesterday as far as uh, comments on that go. Again, he didn't really say anything about Hassan Reddick, unfortunately. But uh, the best thing I could poss- I possibly heard from him was simply we're not done. Good. Go out there and, and don't be done. I would very much appreciate that. Jeffrey Lurie, Nick Sirianni is supposed to talk to the media today. 
Jeffrey Laurie, I'm sure we'll get asked about playing in Brazil. Uh, why keep Nick Sirianni? What led him to that decision? Did he buy a yacht while he was yacht shopping, while we were all thinking Nick Sirianni might get, might get canned? You know? There's a lot of questions for Jeffrey Laurie. This is one of the few times we get to hear from Jeffrey Laurie. My biggest thing is what went into the decision to keep Nick Sirianni. Other than that, what is Nick Sirianni's role in your eyes? What are your expectations from him? What about Kellen Moore? Did you like? What about Vic Fangio? Did you like? Is there a sense of relief that you finally have Vic Fangio after only having guys that were running a Fangio-type scheme? His thoughts on the way the season ended last year? Things like that. That's what I hope we'll hear from Jeffrey Lurie. From Nick Sirianni, I do not say this with any ounce of sarcasm or crassness, okay? I say this out of sheer curiosity, legitimate curiosity. And for anyone that is just blindly supporting Nick Sirianni and thinking that he's got the answers, you're not going to like what I'm about to say. And now I know those are, are f those are few and far between, those people that exist, but they exist. It's a legitimate question to ask Nick Sirianni what his role is. Now, the literal question, the verbatim question, was not what is it you say you, you do here, as in as what we've all had fun with since Nick Sirianni said what he said. But when Tim McMahon has said, what is your role with the team? Now, that might sound like a horrible, stupid question to some people. But if you had followed the bouncing ball with Nick Sirianni, then you understand why that is a legitimate question. To give you the brief synopsis, the brief summary of it, okay? Nick Sirianni calls plays. Nick Sirianni doesn't call plays. Nick Sirianni then a year later admits that he doesn't call plays, but he does do the game plan. Shane Steichen then helps lead this team by calling plays to the Super Bowl and Nick Sirianni doing the game plan. Then this year, Nick Sirianni doing the game plan. It's my offense. It's my offense. It's my offense. Offense start to struggle. It's my offense. It's my offense. Brian calls the plays. My offense. My offense. Brian calls the plays. End of the year press conference. The offensive coordinator will be in charge of the offense. The defensive coordinator will be in charge of the defense. So hold on. So you're not calling plays anymore. Not breaking news. We've known that for a while. You're not doing it's hits offense. Or are you not doing the game plan? Like. What's going on here? You're not even in charge of the offense anymore? What's going on here? If you follow that bouncing ball, you realize why it's a legitimate question to then say, okay, your role has been pretty well defined here when you're not calling plays. And that's not the end all be all. But when he started out doing it and then surrendered it, that's a little downgrade in terms of impact you have directly on the game plan as it's being executed in the game. So that's a step back. Then to refer to it as, yeah, at one point he said it was going to be our offense. Okay. Well, I'm sure you're not going to be. This will make the Nick Sirianni people, the Chiriani people for Chiriani. This will make them happy. You're not just going to be a potted plant. What type of impact are you going to have on the offense? I would like Nick Sirianni to get a second chance today to answer that question. Nick, have you had any more thought, had any more time to think about what your role is going to be with this team? Obviously, the head coach. But in the past, we've heard you talk about game plan. Is that still the case? Or is everything going to be shared? Think of it as a, a pie chart. Think of it as eating a cookie. One bite was taken away when Nick Sirianni gave play calling away. Huge chunk was taken away when Nick Sirianni was like, oh, yeah, the game plan, that's going to be split now. Huh? Okay, well, what about the other things you're supposed to do really well? Stop the bleeding. Find a way to stop the bleeding if the team is just imploding at the end of the year. I couldn't do that. Another bite taken away. Supposed to have power over who your coaches are going to be? Doesn't seem like you had power over these guys. You made the decision to move on from Sean Desai and Matt Patricia. That was dumb. Um, this is where we're at. I'd like Nick Sirianni to get another opportunity to answer that question. I am general. I am legitimately curious about what his general role is. Not his job title. I understand his job title is head coach of the Philadelphia Eagles. I get that. I want to know what he's going to be doing throughout the week. Uh, on Monday, I'm going to massage Jalen Hurts' shoulders, make sure he's good to go. I don't I don't think that's going to be the case. But I, I, Nick, I, all I want to know is, 
with Shane Steichen with Brian Johnson. You said you were doing the game plan. When you surrendered play calling to Shane Steichen, you said, I'm going to do the game plan. Shane Steichen's going to call the plays. With Brian Johnson, you said, it's my offense, but he calls the plays. With Kellen Moore, is he really going to be in charge of the offense? Will he have final say over the way you want to attack a defense? I know everyone's going to have, oh, it's, we're going to share ideas, sure, but it wasn't like that before. At least that's not what it sounded like. I would, because look, as much fun as we can have with what is it you say you do here, as much fun as we have with that, I don't want to believe that my head coach is a potted plant. I don't want to believe that the head coach of the football team that I want to win football games is just like, hey, good job, guys. Hey, good hustle. Like, I don't want to believe that. I want to believe that he's in the trenches, man. I want to believe that he's making things happen. He's a mover. He's a shaker. That's what I want to believe. I just can't believe it right now. So I'd like Nick Sirianni to get a second chance to talk about what his role is going to be when he's got an offensive coordinator that has more experience than his last two offensive coordinators combined calling plays. And I want to hear what he has to say also about Vic Fangio and what to expect from his defense. That's what I want to hear from Nick Sirianni today. And I would love to hear that Nick Sirianni is saying, I'm still going to do the game plan, and Kellen is going to call the plays. He'll be helping me a little bit more because of his experience and his success that he's had already in the NFL. So why wouldn't I invite that in? That's a that's an answer I would love to hear from Nick Sirianni. I'd be like, okay, all right, Nick, there you go. There you go, fella. Then, of course, some other people say, I don't want him touching anything with a game plan. Man's a moron. No, I don't. I, I'm going to, right now, I would like to not believe that. I'd like to not believe that. Um, so that's where I'm at with that. Let's get into the NFL hip drop. Okay, folks. I'm a man of extremes. All right. And I've suggested something like this in the past where a player was in danger. And I was just like, if you're in the defense, or excuse me, if you, it was, a, oh gosh, who was it? I'm, uh, I can't remember the running back uh, who was returning the football. Oh, was it? I think it, it might have been, was it Josh Huff? I think it might have been Josh Huff. But there was a play on a kick return where a face mask of, I think it was Josh Huff, got grabbed. This is many years ago. Got grabbed, turned on a kick return. As if the intention was to rip his head off his body. And there was no call made. Ball carrier. Okay, It wasn't like he was down the other end of the field. He was blocking. No, he was the ball carrier. I want to say it was Josh Huff. And the kickoff team, kicking team, grabbed his face mask, turned it as if to rip his head off. No call was made. No 15-yard penalty was awarded. Nothing like that. And I was like, that's the most blatant of a missed call you can have the most obvious of a missed call you have. Like if you're on defense, you're like, Oh, we're not, or if you're, if you're playing in the game, you're like, well, well, we're not protected. This officiating crew is not paying attention. Let's get the hell out of here. Okay. I'm not playing in this game. If this is the way they're going to call it, I'm, this is dangerous. So now the NFL, if you're a defensive player, how are you supposed to tackle? My suggestion is don't just don't. I want to see a score of 251 to 249. I want to see that score in a game. I want to see uh, a Madden game played against a computer on rookie. Is that the lowest level you could play? With like a, a world champion Madden player. Like I want a video game score. Well, I guess if it was rookie, the other team would score 249 points. But anyway, you know what I'm saying. Because you're put in an impossible position. Darius Slay even commented on it. He put it out there into the ether yesterday by saying there's going to be a lot of missed tackles. All right. J.J. Watt putting it out there saying, let's just move to belts and flags. A lot of people with the flag football comments yesterday. The hip drop penalty at the NFL owners meetings, uh, or excuse me, the hip drop tackle was banned yesterday. Basically, it's a hip version of of the uh, Roy Williams tackle on Terrell Owens. You can't pull a player down around the hips from behind. A lot of players get their ankles landed on, twisting knees, whatever the case may be. If a player gets by you then, in an open field situation where it's just you and him, and you're a defensive player, if he gets by you, you just, you just olay it? 
What do you do? What do you do in that situation? Oh, he beat me, so he's going to have a step on me. You're already at a disadvantage because you're reacting to the offensive player's move. So if he gets a, a quarter step on you, you can't turn and tackle him because of the risk of the penalty? When everything started coming out about helmet the helmet rules, when things started coming out about uh, hitting the strike zone, as they call it, the quarterback, the little league strike zone, you know, shoulders to knees. You can't go lower than the knees, right? You got to stay actually above the knees. What am I saying? Just above the knees to the uh, shoulders of the quarterback. And you certainly can't hit his head and you can't bring him down too low and all that. I told you that the NFL, their goal is to add games to the schedule. People told me I was not. They can't do that. It's, it's not. It's not a safe enough game. Play the game's too dangerous. Uh, players, uh, the, the player association, will never go for it. And I, I honestly just remember thinking, like, what are you thinking? The goal of the NFL is to make more money. You know what the goal of the player is? To make more money. Are you going to make more money if you're playing more games? Absolutely. How do you sell players on playing more games but still taking their health into consideration? You no longer have hits to the head. You no longer have the uh, the the you hit the quarterback wherever. You can't even land flat on the quarterback. You can't throw the quarterback into the ground. Running backs can't run with their head down outside the box. Like all that stuff. All that is protect players. Uh, protect players. And mainly to sell them on the idea that the game's safer to add games to the schedule. I wouldn't be surprised at, at any point in my lifetime, in the not-too-distant future, they added another game to the NFL schedule when they add teams in Europe, which is where the NFL wants to go with this, which is wh where Roger Goodell wants to go with this, to make this a global game. You add another game to the schedule, you'll get another bye week, you'll get games played in London, uh, 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 Germany, uh, what is the other part of London that they play? Or the Trotterdam? Trotterdam? Whatever the hell it's called. You're going to get played. More games in Brazil, which isn't Europe, I understand, but more global. Uh, that's the overall goal. That's what they want. <coughs> the only way they do that is if they're able to get another bye week and they play another game. The only way they do that is they make the game safer. And in their heads, this is making the game safer. Oh, no, you look. Now defensive players, the only thing you could do is tackle a player in a by-the-book, textbook form tackle. And even that, if it's a quarterback, you better not land on him. I I think it's dumb. I, I there's Football is dangerous. If you make a dangerous thing less dangerous, it's still dangerous. You have to accept that like every player that set foot on the football field has accepted that, that it is dangerous. This hip drop is complete bull. Um, <laughs> this hip drop is complete BS. 15 yard penalty will be awarded if a defensive player is found guilty, is called for a hip drop tackle. This is the direction the NFL wants to go. They feel like they're making the game safer. And does it make the game safer? Sure, but it's still dangerous. Oh, 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 of course. I forgot the other thing, too. Uh, it helps your fantasy football points. I saw Pro Football Focus highlight that. Now, I'm not highlighting that uh, because I think the hip drop should be brought in as they were uh, – it wasn't pro football focus, excuse me. Pro football talk. Pro football talk highlighted it. Now, you, you should like this rule because think about how many uh, Mark Andrews, if he was your tight end last year, do you really want it? Do you really want this? Do you really want this to be a legal tackle? Um, not the argument to take here. The argument to take for putting it in there, if you're the NFL, is yeah, if you have an offensive player who is now injured because of that, you might not be watching that same team. As you were, you might not be watching as much as you were. You want those numbers to be up if you're the NFL. And having attempting to have healthier players will obviously keep people more tuned into the game. That's another part of it. It does go into it, just like gambling does. So, for, hey, put me down as this is a stupid rule. Football's dangerous, except the fact that it's dangerous. And the NFL is doing another run 
to try to make the game safer, another run at making the game safer, to expand the schedule again, and then hopefully, by their standard, hopefully, not mine, making the game a global game, having games, more games in Europe, a team in Europe, and another game to the schedule, and another bye week. That's the direction the NFL is going. I, I, I've mentioned this before. The article, of all places, in GQ on Roger Goodell and what his overall desire is for the NFL. <clears throat> and it's world domination above nothing else. <clears throat> Did you stay up for the Sixers last night? If you're listening to me live now, it's 7 o'clock, 7.02 in the morning, okay? If you're listening to me live, you might not have stayed up to watch the 76ers last night. Maybe you watched just the first quarter. If you did, Tyrese Maxey is unbelievable. At one point in the game, it was literally Tyrese Maxey with every Sixers point. Uh, Tyrese Maxey, 18. Sacramento Kings, 16. Tyrese Maxey was literally outscoring the entire Kings team. Scored every point up until the first break of the first quarter. Tyrus Maxey was pouring it on early. Unfortunately, uh, Keegan Murray dropping down three. He's been red hot over the last couple of weeks. Um, had every answer. De'Aaron Fox, a player that I still love to watch, had every answer. Uh, Sabonis was another double-double for him. Third, 54 games of the double-double. Longest streak in the modern era since the ABA-MBA merger. That's pretty impressive. Uh, and the Kings just... Stepped on the gas while the Sixers took their foot off the gas uh, last night. No Kelly Oubre last night in the game. I was watching the first quarter, and I'm like, is somebody else going to take over? Because Tyrese Maxey can't do this by himself, and it never happened. But the Sixers took a tough loss last night. Uh, they're going to be back at it uh, tomorrow night against the um, uh, Clippers again. Clippers lost to the Pacers. Sixers couldn't get any help from James Harden again last night against the uh, Pacers. Um, Halliburton. Had himself a night. Uh, so not a lot of answers there for the 76ers, but uh, no help whatsoever for Tyrese Maxey in the game last night. Finished with 29 points after it's an 18 point, 19 point first quarter. Yeah, it's a pretty good day. Pretty good open for uh, Tyrese Maxey. Uh, bigger news in the world of sports yesterday, nationwide. We've talked about Shohei Otani. I want to take a second and talk about. What went down yesterday? I'm not surprised he didn't take questions. I did not expect him to take questions. It was about 12, 13 minute dissertation he gave where he read from a statement for a lot of it and then commented away from it as well. But the bottom line is I heard what I, I, I don't want to say needed to hear because look, I want Shohei Otani thrown out of baseball. If he's going to be a Dodger, I don't want to play in baseball. Like I want him out. Now, I, now, from a baseball perspective, if I wasn't a Phillies fan, I'd be like, I like watching this guy play. But since he's a Dodger, I don't want him to play baseball. So I'm kind of rooting for, like, he's guilty as hell, man. That's what I'm rooting for, so that he can't play, and he's banned, and he was making bets on baseball. There's no evidence of that. But, like, I'm just hoping that that's the worst-case scenario. Like, I'm hope, I'm, I do want the worst-case scenario because I don't want him playing for the Dodgers. And you know what? That's, that's respect. That's respecting the talent that he is, okay? So let me just throw that out of the way. Let me just mention that. And then move on to this. But as a sports fan, trying to take my Philadelphia fandom out of it, as a sports fan, I don't want a player being guilty of betting on baseball. I don't want a player guilty of betting. I don't want a betting scandal. I don't want that. So if that's what you're rooting for as a pure sports fan, then you heard everything you wanted to hear yesterday. I had no knowledge of this. This was all Mitsuhara. I was betrayed. I didn't pay his debt. He took money from me. I just learned about this a couple of days ago. I've never placed a bet. I've never bet on baseball. I don't do that. Then you heard everything you wanted to hear yesterday. Ongoing investigation can't answer questions. Not surprised to hear that at any I was that's exactly what I expected from yesterday. I was surprised. The only thing that did surprise me was that he did go as so far as to say, I've never been on baseball. I've never been on a game. I've never placed a bet. I didn't willingly cover his betting debt. I didn't transfer money. Money was stolen from me. All this is thing are things I learned a couple of days ago. 
I, if you're just a sports purist, you heard everything you wanted to hear yesterday. Everything. And ESPN put together this timeline. And I caught it. And I think it just helps follow the bouncing ball for a lot of people here that might have missed some stuff. But so last week, Mitsuharu and Otani spokesperson tells ESPN that Otani agreed to pay Mitsuhara's gambling debts. So that's from a source to ESPN saying that Otani knew and paid. Okay. Then a day or two later, Otani's lawyer say, no, he was the victim of a massive theft. All right. Uh, same day, Mutsuhara then tells ESPN he lied and that Otani had no knowledge of his gambling debt. Okay. Uh, backdoor payoff? You don't know. You don't know. Under the table payoff? You don't know. Then uh, on March 22nd, that's when the uh, Major League Baseball said, I think we're going to look into this. Otani then comes out yesterday on March 25th and says he had no knowledge of everything that was going on, and no, he did not pay Mitsuhara's debt and all that. It just seems so weird to me that a translator got his hands... Like, he, it's not his agent. Like, even that would be weird. But it's not his agent saying, hey, by the way, give me your routing numbers. <laughs> like, what? Look, the, the interpreter is around. I mean, is he that slick where he's finding the banking information? It's very possible. It's happened to other people that haven't been as close or worked as much hand in hand. So it's possible. But it's just so damn odd to me. The way this story has come out. First, he knew about it. First, Otani knew about it and covered it. Then he didn't. And Mitsuhara stands up in the Dodgers clubhouse and says, all this, like I'll put it to you like this. Sometimes when I look at things like this that are a little suspicious, I think about, okay, well, how will I, how would I cover it up? And one of the ways I would cover it up is be like, I'm not even going to tell the team anything. I'm going to have this guy tell people he did it. Because nothing's better than a guy just going, yeah, it was me. I did it. It's my fault. He could be following orders in that regard for the Dodgers and Otani. I mean, look, this is all speculation. Right now, there's no evidence. But when it comes to something like this, it just makes you really – hold on a second. So you address the team? Otani is fighting about this with everybody else? If I'm Otani, dude, pull me aside and tell me I'm getting robbed. Don't make me look like an idiot in front of everyone where I don't even know I'm being robbed or I'm being taken for an idiot by my interpreter who's taking me for $4.5 million. It, it's, that's, it, what, that's like almost too perfect of a way. Oh, he came out to the entire team that he was a thief. Huh? That seems like a very private matter that shouldn't be had with anybody in the room other than Otani and maybe his agent and a lawyer. I can actually explain it. Uh, and maybe even the Dodgers owner because he's the employer of all these people. And it's happening in the workplace. It just seems too perfect. Did I hear everything that Otani was like, everything I wanted to hear from a sports fan's perspective? I heard everything I wanted to hear from Otani. It doesn't mean anything. It just advances the story to the next level where the investigation continues. It seems way too weird to me the way this has come together. I would believe it more if Otani did find out about it and just said, Dude, let me pay for it. I'll pay for it. But being that stolen, fired, it, it seems like something's getting covered up to me. It just does not pass my smell test. And I got a big old schnaz, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, that's where I'm at. I don't know what your take on it was, but that's my take on it. Let me tell you about the great people at MyBookie. <laughs> MyBookie.ag. Check out MyBookie. MyBookie.ag and take advantage of all they have to offer at MyBookie.ag. Download the app, create an account, use promo code Farzi, and get up to $1,000 redeemable at MyBookie. MyBookie.ag. Want to bet on the world of basketball? Go right ahead. Want to bet on the world of baseball? Go right ahead. I don't know how to say that in Japanese, but go for it. Um, you can do it all. My bookie, mybookie.ag, NCAA tournament, all that fun stuff. And you can also bet on the world of politics. You can also bet on the world of television. Who's going to end up with who? Who's going to propose to who? Bachelor? 
Uh, you can do all that in my bookie, mybookie.ag. Download the app. Use promo code Farzy and get up to a thousand dollars redeemable cash bonus at uh, my bookie, mybookie.ag. How about the game time app? Want to go to the game? Want to go to opening day? Bring your umbrella, but get your tickets at the game time app. Download the game time app to your phone. Use promo code Farzy when you create an account, and you'll get twenty dollars off your first purchase at the game time app. Take advantage of all they have to offer the game time app. Uh, also, they have last minute ticket deals, flash ticket deals, even ticket deals for an hour after the event starts to make sure that you get mega huge Kajunga savings. And they also uh, have tickets for an hour after the event starts. So don't forget about that. Is you miss the uh, the uh, the opening act? Maybe the middle. You get the big deal. You get the big deal. No, even even if it's a game, seventh, eighth, ninth inning. That's where the magic happens, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so download the Game Time app. Have yourself a good time. How about PHL Sports Nation, Philadelphia Sports Nation, enhancing your Philadelphia sports fan experience across all social media and blogs? That's phlsportsnation.com. Let's get into the chat to check and see how you guys are doing on this fine Tuesday morning. Oh, wait, hold on. I just, why did I just see this? Why was this the first comment I saw? And I just went right, right past it. Yes, why Niners wine? Baltimore I-695 bridge was hit by a cargo ship and collapsed. Traffic's going to be ugly for months. If you haven't seen it, it's worth a Google. It's insane. I made a wrong turn. Uh, pretty, pretty bonkers. Sean Gillespie, yeah, so good traffic knowledge. Thank you. Sean Gillespie, what's going on? Sean Kilmerand, what's popping? Real RMP, in 10 years, the NFL will stand for National Flag League and women will join the sport. Is that the worst thing? Is that the worst thing? Did you ever see Unnecessary, or necessary Roughness? Did you ever see Necessary Roughness? Kathy Ireland? Come on now. Is that the worst thing? Scott Bakula? Fuji, what's popping? Wait, hold on. Now that I'm thinking about this, interrupt this. Scott Bakula, Kathy Ireland, Rob Schneider, Fumbalaya, Fumbalaya. What was that guy's name? Robert Loggia. May he rest in peace. Oh, uh, yeah. Great movie. Fuji, what's popping? Fuji, how is philosophy that he can't draft certain positions, defensive backs, and wide receivers? Huh. I mean, Devontae Smith's pretty good. Linebackers to top it off. Linebackers, uh, corner, eh, not great. Linebacker, next to non-existent. April, good morning, April. Dev, what's popping, Dev? Sean Kilrain, for for it's the puppet masters, Lori and Howie. Howie has too much power. He's great with contracts and money, but can't draft a lick. Prime example, Rieger over Justin Jefferson. Yep, that is example number one, uh, or one example. I agree. I agree. I mean, I am looking forward to Jalen Carter. I'm looking forward to the rest of Jordan Davis. I am looking forward to the rest of Devontae Smith. I do like Jalen Hurts. These are all guys how he drafted. How he went, you talk about philosophy. The Jalen Hurts thing is the most anti-philosophical thing in football ever and stupid. Like the, the the philosophy behind it. But this is why there is exceptions to every rule. If you started to get the sense that Carson Wentz might not be the guy, and you're like, okay, he could still be the guy because I know how talented he can play. I know how talented he is. So he gave him the money. But he was like, I also know he could be a little bit of a head case. So why not we be a quarterback factory? And get Jalen Hurts. All right. Murda, what's up? James, good morning. Tyrese Maxey without Embiid doesn't have an identity. Like, Here's my deal with Tyrese Maxey. So he's done this for a couple of games now where he'll come out of the gates firing in the first quarter. He's dropped 17 points. I think he's dropped 18 or 19 points in the first quarter already uh, in a few different games. And then he'll finish with like 27 points. And, like, that's a good night still, 27 points in total. But if you get up to that kind of hot start, where does that go? I know you're only playing about five minutes of the third quarter. Uh, or, excuse me, I know you're only playing about five minutes of the second quarter. You're coming out in the third quarter, and then you're closing the game in the fourth quarter. 
So you're still playing a lot of minutes. Where does that go? Does the aggression get less? Does the other team make an adjustment? Does the other team go, well, I guess nobody else is going to hurt us, so let's just make sure that we attack this Tyrese Maxey fella? Because that's what it seems like. Hopefully it's not the case. Hopefully this is all in Tyrese Maxey's head, but it happened again last night. This is going to bother me if I don't find it. Uh, Sixers dropped to 39 and 33. Gross. Uh, Maxi, 29 points is what he finished with last night. 108 to 96, by the way, was the final score. Who cares? They lost. Um, the Aaron Fox only had 23 last night. Go figure. A lot of Kentucky guys in last night's game. That was also jumping out to me. Okay, here's a prime example, all right? Tyrese Maxey leads the team 29 points. The next leading scorer of all people on 5 of 15 shooting was Tobias Harris with 12 points. Not great. Not great. Uh, as far as Maxey, let me go to his first quarter. Tyrese Maxey. Okay. Get out of here. Nobody cares. 2, 4, 6, 12, 15, 18. Yeah, at least 18 in the first quarter, and then only 11 the rest of the way. Not great. Wow. Here's the statement. KJ, I'm not watching football this year, Farzi. There will be no tackling with this rule. I'm going to watch cricket. Wait. My Eagles didn't tackle anyway. Laugh out loud. KJ, well played. I did have a thought yesterday of um, James Bradbury being like, what's a what's a hip drop tackle? No, no, hold on a second. What's a tackle? Anyway. <clears throat> I've watched cricket before. I have no idea what's happening. I was in Dublin, Ireland. I watched uh, I watched cricket at T Trinity College with my uh, my buddy Bennett, who I've referenced many times. And uh, we we're just watching it. We watched it like 45 minutes. I went, hey, dude, do, 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 you understand, do you have any idea what's happening? He's like, no. I was like, neither do I. Let's go drink. <clears throat> and then we went to Temple Bar and we had ourselves a time. Uh, we need Dean to be 100% so he, wasn't, so he doesn't become injury prone. James, I agree. I would love to see him play in every game the Eagles have for the next, you know, 10 years. But um, a lot of people are not confident in that. Sean Kilrain. Wow. He doesn't know or see talent. He's never played the game to really understand it. <clears throat> both, I, I assume you're talking about Howie, but both, it could be said for both Howie Ro Roseman and Jeffrey Lurie. And that is, that, that, that was my problem in the beginning with Howie Roseman. Like there was guys in the front office, even with Joe Banner, that didn't have a football pedigree that were making these football decisions. And they're making it because of their financial background. Like I used to make the point all the time about like Jeffrey Lurie or Jeffrey Lurie. Uh, well, Jeffrey Lurie's a, the, the owner shouldn't have a football background. Like you're now you're not making your money in football, generally speaking, right? No, pretty much every speaking. Uh, you're, he was like a film producer, right? <clears throat> he won an Oscar, as a matter of fact. Um, Joe Banner ran a department store and was childhood friends with Jeffrey Lurie. Howie Roseman is a lawyer accountant by trade. And worked his way up. And I admire that in how he was working your way up in a front office. But yeah, it, it, it is troublesome. It is troublesome. But then you look at a guy like John Lynch. John Lynch won a Super Bowl as a player. He's done a good job recruiting talent uh, in San Francisco. He's been to three Super Bowls now? Two Super Bowls as a general manager? Hasn't won, though. Howie's won. Sean Kilrain, got to get football minds in the war room to make those picks, not Howie. Hard to disagree. Chuck Watson, what's popping? Uh, Sean Kilrain, Howie Roseman has traded up in the first round four to the last five drafts, 2019, traded up 25 to 22 for Andre Diller, traded up 12 to 10 for Devontae Smith. Yep. Uh... <laughs> uh, Corey Hallen, Sirianni was cooked. Probably. Been 10 years since Chip Kelly released to Sean Jackson. I still haven't recovered from that. James Alexander III. 
That is a rough one, James. Generational talent here in Philadelphia, like Deshaun McCoy and Deshaun Jackson. And Deshaun Jackson got released. What I've broken it down to is Chip Kelly just didn't like him. Forget all the gang tie BS. Wait, hold on a second. People in the NFL had they know people in gangs? What? Uh, Chip Kelly f that entire team up. Yeah, absolutely. Hell of a compliment. Just take it. Hey, Reddick was a closer in a lot of games too. When we needed it, he got the sack several on fourth down. Game on the line. I'm taking the compliment. I'm taking the compliment that Bryce off is Mariano Rivera. Or is like. Sorry. Mario Rivera. We need a 5-2 defense. <laughs> uh, video is crazy. Yeah. Of the of the, the thing? The, what the thing? The guy? The thing? Uh, the bridge? <laughs> Eric Wisniewski, what's going on? Job, uh, Nick's job is to get coffee for Howie. KJ, Farzi, why do we act like Sirian is the only head coach to not call plays, yet we crucify him for it and nobody else? Because it's not, see, that's not the reason we're crucifying Nick Sirianni. The reason we're crucifying Nick Sirianni is not because he doesn't call plays. It's that we have continued to see a dwindling amount of responsibility from Nick Sirianni. Calling plays to not calling plays turned out to just be the tip of the iceberg. A lot of people don't need to hear this again, but I feel like a few people do. So I'll just say it one more time. He goes from calling plays to not calling plays to doing just the game plan. Okay. And I'm sure making decisions on fourth down. Fine. Then he talks about how he is, it's his offense and uh, Brian Johnson's calling the plays. Okay. Then he goes to offensive coordinators in charge of the offense. It's going to be his offense. Dwindling responsibility from Nick Sirianni. So you say, okay, fine. He's not calling plays. I guess he's not doing as much game plan, dwindle, game planning, dwindling responsibility from Nick, Nick, Nick Sirianni. Okay, so if you're not going to do those things, are you going to be like Dan Campbell where you're going to be a great motivator and a great leader of men? Because I didn't see that this year. So it's not the calling plays thing is old. Like that to me is old news, but it's worth acknowledging when you're trying to highlight the dwindling amount of responsibility from a head coach in the NFL. The not calling plays is the, is the first domino. It's boop. And there's a lot of dominoes that are go right there. Uh, but, but the, oh, Hutch, thank you so much. Great interview with the bo boys on 365 yesterday. John McMullen says the Eagles probably won't, pay three pass rushers over 10 million why not eagles have 25 million in cap space with the players that they signed well maybe they do want to go good justin simmons cross my fingers that that's what they'll do uh either way i don't think they're going to be paying hassan reddick over 10 million dollars at least not this year that's where i think a restructure comes in handy john mcmullen was blown away by my floating shelves When it's done, I glued. So if you didn't see the interview, I have a, I'm making an 88 and a half inch floating shelf to go under my TV. Right now, since we moved in, it hasn't really been top priority. We have my grandparents from like the 1950s, 1960s, a Zenith radio record player console. It's, it's awesome. Like, I, I catch myself, like, because it's under my TV, I'll be looking at it, and I'll just be like, I wonder, like, what happened with that stain on the speaker right there? Like, what happened? Was Pop Up getting after it one night? Was he having a little too much Jack Daniels? That was my Jack. My, my uh, Pop Up, my grandfather would drink, um, uh, take a shot of Jack Daniels. Like, every, I thought it was every night when he got, got home from, he was a deacon in the Catholic church. So he'd go to like funeral parlors and, you know, give last rites a lot. So like he was, he had a full day and he also was an, an usher for the Orioles for 25 years, Baltimore Orioles. He lived in Baltimore. Um, and you'd come home and he would take a shot. And I'm like, to pop up getting after the Jack Daniels a little too much, spill it on the speaker. Like there's, you know, things like that. I think about, but anyway, I'm building these floating shelves, man. I, my mind is all over this. Uh, I'm building these floating shelves and John McMullen was really taken back.
at what a floating shelf was. It's a trend, babe. It's a trend. My wife and I seem to think it looks cool. But anyway, yeah, I like a sound reddick. <laughs> Chip Kelly. Chip Kelly thought he could control grown men. Tell them what they ate, what to lift, how much sleep to get, how that worked, Chippy. Haas better be closer. Haas is a better closer. Hassan Reddick, Corey Allen. Me not disagreeing. Ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba -da. Haas better than Huff, says Allen. Uh, Corey Allen. Not even a debate. I agree. Well, so here's the only thing I, I'll say, Corey, I'll disagree with uh, the word laughable. Bryce Huff does look pretty damn good. On passing downs, yes. Looks very good. So it's not laughable. Um, because he might grow to be better than a sound Reddick. Now, is that going to be difficult? Well, not everybody gets four straight, you know, quadruple sack, or excuse me, four straight double digit sack seasons. The defensive player of the year consideration like two years ago. So you're betting on a younger player on the way up. So that's the point where I'll say it's not laughable. Unlikely, yeah. But I wouldn't say like it's impossible. If, I, if, if something to me is laughable, I think, oh, that's impossible. It's not happening. You know, It could happen. The Eagles are betting $51.1 million on it. Sean Kilroy, no fun league. NFL is running the game. Eric Wisniewski, ruining the game, says Eric Wisniewski. Oh, here we go, KJ. I understand the hip drop tackle but uh, ban, but the refs are going to be calling anything that smells like a hip drop tackle. Hip drop does sound like something smelly. Uh, so basically, don't wrap them up by the waist at all. I'd retire if I was on defense. I'm telling you, this defense, just let everybody score. Okay, WC13, uh, 17 games is already too many. Is it? It's not, and I'll tell you why. We're going to watch. The NFL will make awful decisions. When they, were, when they were trying to be the knight in shining armor for domestic violence, they made terrible decisions. Ray Rice, uh, what was it, like a three-game, four-game suspension? What the hell was it for Ray Rice? And then the video came out, and it was like, indefinite suspension. We don't know what we're doing. And the Ezekiel Elliott situation, The after Ray Rice, the NFL hired a female investigator to help identify more with domestic violence. The female investigator they sent to go interview uh, Ezekiel Elliott, she came back to the NFL and was like, oh, I don't think he's guilty at all. I think this woman's making a lot of stuff up. And the NFL was like, shut up, woman. We're ignoring you. Ezekiel Elliott, you're suspended. Like, that, you know what women really love? You know how you really show a woman respect? Ignore them. They love that. The NFL could not have handled those situations worse, man. Worse. Huh. And guess what? People still watched. Oh, what about the integrity of the game? I talk about the uh, the, the replacement officials. I'll, I'll, I'll reference the replacement officials from years ago, right? People still watch the game. Colin Kaepernick kneeling down during the national anthem. You know what? I know someone that actually gave their season tickets back. A Ravens fan who gave their season tickets back. Said, I'm out. I'm out. That person stuck by it. But they still watch. But they still watch. They don't go to the games anymore. But they still watch. We will still watch. You put on football, we're going to watch. The only thing that would make us not watch, literally the only thing, is if the defensive players – if a player got by them, got a quarter step on them, if they just went from... For the people on the podcast, I'm about to do an amazing, accurate demonstration of a player on offense blowing by a player on defense and what that defensive player should do. The only way people are going to stop watching is if the defensive player goes like this. Start, they're about to make the tackle. They're about to make the tackle, and they get by. And then they just stand up. They're like, well, that's it. That's it. I got by me. I'm beaten. Nothing I could do about it. For the people on the podcast, I must say that was a perfect, perfect reenactment of a player attempting to make a tackle and then a prediction of what they should do after. 
uh, suggestion. I guess. Uh, two and touch football coming. Says real MP. <clears throat> More neck rolls. Good God. Put red shirts on the quarterback. I am almost. I'm almost at this point. Just do that. I did not see Torch's interview on Sandstrom. <clears throat> Ooh, April, here we go. So I deal with fraud at work every day. Uh, you'd be amazed at how often people get scammed in the different ways. I I, I hear you. I mean, I, I'm sure I would be amazed. Um, that being said, I don't think Otani's hands are completely clean. Right. Like here's April. I find it easier to believe that he was in some way, shape, or form scammed than I find it easier to believe that I find it easy to believe that he knew nothing about the gambling. Like, if you want to tell me that you got scammed for more money than you thought, okay. But at this point, for me to believe that he had nothing to do with the gambling, I, that's tough. That's a tough pill to swallow. <laughs> Luke Skylifter, this is a new one. Forget about flag football. Just paint the player's hands. Paint their hands, and if they get the player, then they're down. I like that. Two and touch. Uh, ba -ba Dr. Harry Peter, urologist. Hey. <laughs> hey. Steve Ike finds that funny as well. Finds that funny. Um, Flyers need another backup goalie. What about the UFL? Will you watch? I generally, I'll get reminded that it's on. I'll be flipping through. I'll be like, what is this? Is this a movie? My first, usually UFL, XFL, USFL, when those are on. Now, are those the ones that are combining for the UFL? Yeah. Usually I'll be like, is this any given Sunday? Because remember, ever get any given Sunday, they had the faux team, the fake teams. The Dallas team was coached by Johnny Unitas. Remember that? <laughs> What were they, the Knights, the Dallas Knights or something? Farzi, you showed some real lateral quickness in that defensive scenario. Ever consider a career change to outside corner for the Eagles? You know, when I played football my one year of freshman football at Archbishop Wood High School, I was a corner. I was a safety. And for one game, I was backup quarterback. Because our backup quarterback got hurt, and they need someone who could throw a little bit. And guess who could really zip it? Yours truly. <laughs> Dirty D. The fact that your name's Dirty D and you're saying these refs are going to get castrated this season, that's, that's even funnier. Uh, they, oh, I really got carried away there. Wow, it's, a, it's 735, ladies and gentlemen. It's an uh, hour and 15-minute show. Um, but I started late, late, so there you go. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. No. Uh, drafted Landon and Jordan. That's true. That's true. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's get to the morning rush brought by Sky Motor Cars, skymotorcars.com. As I mentioned, the Sixers, unfortunately, lost their last game of their four-game West Coast road trip. They fell uh, to the Kings last night. They went one and three in their four games. But if you told me they were going to go one and three in the four games, I'd say, hey, you better beat the Clippers. And they did. So now the Sixers are going to be back at it tomorrow night, Wednesday night, 7.30 tip-off against the Clippers, back on the road for two games against the Cavs and uh, the, uh, the 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 Raptors, fellas. Uh, those games are Friday and Sunday. So look forward to that. Flyers are back on the ice tonight. Looking to get off uh, or get back from their four-one loss to the Panthers. They got the Rangers tonight, seven o'clock puck drop in New York. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. This is the Far as You Show, presented by my bookie, mybookie.ag. So catch you guys tomorrow. Uh, have a great rest of your day, everybody. Uh, see you soon.